Hi marketers, welcome to another episode of the Marketing Maverick Show. My name is Chris. Hi, I'm Asim. And today our guest is Greg Kilstrom, who is a SaaS business owner, CEO and founder of CareerGeek, which is a marketplace for hiring freelancers online. And uh, he is a customer experience and digital transformation expert, um, building up a web agency, web experience agency for, uh, yeah, for, for about 16 years before it got acquired. So he has an extensive background in um, digital agencies. And um, his agency was um, Carousel 30, and uh, in which he also worked with enterprise clients like Toyota, Porsche, or even NASA. And uh, yeah, we want to learn from Greg what it takes to build a big online agency, as well as also hear about um, his journey in building a SaaS platform, which is something we're obviously very interested in. So we're very excited to chat. So welcome, Greg. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to talking. Nice. Okay. Firstly, um, let's let's go back because uh, you started your agency back in two thousand and three. What motivated you to to start out in business with with, with that agency? Yeah, sure. So I uh, I started out um, before, right before that, or a few years before that, I guess. I was actually working for a a startup. Um, a tech startup back, you know, so it was 2001, 2002. So the original internet boom. And, you know, I, I, I liked that, that work is, it, it was an exciting, uh, exciting time to be working, but, um, I, the company, like many others in that era, uh, you know, got funding, had, had some good ideas, but didn't really have, have much of a business plan and, um, you know, just kind of fizzled out, I guess, towards after, after a few years. And so I found myself, um, myself and probably 50 other people um, getting laid off the same day and just sort of made the decision at that point, and this was, um, this was mid-2002, that I didn't really want to go back to work for another company that could just, you know, make some poor decisions and I'd be out of a job and, and all those things. So, I, you know, I, I made the decision to, be, to go into business for myself at that point. Um, so for a little while, I freelanced myself and um, you know, just kind of built on the network that I had at the at the startup, and, and just started growing a, a network here in the in the Washington D.C. area. Got so many clients as a freelancer that um, I had to make a decision: either I turn down work because I just you know I'm one person, I can only do so much, or I partner with other people or bring other people on, basically start a company. And so I made the decision to to start the agency at that point. Uh, partnered with a few other people and and that's you know it, it was really it was about I wanted to do more of what I love doing and um, I, I had some lessons along the way that that's not exactly how <laughs> entrepreneurship works because I ended up having to do a lot of things that I didn't like doing as well but um, but it really came out of um, you know just wanting some more independence cool I think there's so many things Greg I and you have in common um, it feels like it feels unreal because I started my journey in a job as well and then moved towards freelance and then set up my own agency as well. And I remember you mentioned somewhere that uh, you you like this combination of technology, marketing and creativity, those three things. Right. And that exactly is what I, I, why, what I like as well in, in this whole industry um, because I sometimes even dabble with Photoshop or Adobe XD but my background has also been from like the programming um, side and overall the creative side of, um, you know, coming up with new ideas and new things. That is that is exactly my um, impetus for working in the industry. So it feels there's so many things in common. Uh, but I want to also go back to the agency model, because as I'm running my agency right now, um, obviously there's challenges every day. So one of the things which I always want to understand is, if, for example, you, I remember you mentioning that you had a photography degree. Is that correct? Yeah. And then you moved on to like writing HTML and stuff. So how, who was the first person you hired in your agency and what was their skill set? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I had, I had three other partners when we first started the agency. So um, we, we started the company basically based on I did design um, my, one of my partners did the development and, and the coding and, and I also knew some video 
editing and as well um we had someone that was a project manager and someone that was in charge of the the money um and so you know we kind of just started and you know to be honest if i were to have start you know if i were to do it again today i would have picked a very different skill set and the two of those roles were less necessary to have full-time people on and stuff like that but that's kind of where we started from i think so you know, we went through that iteration. I ended up buying all of those partners out um, after a couple of years, uh, you know, just for, for various personal reasons and, and stuff like that. Some of them needed to leave and, and just, I, I, I wanted to just kind of take things in a, in a different direction. So then I ended up acquiring a company that um, did software, like web development, software development and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's a long answer to your question because the first time I actually hired someone, I think was a marketing person because I, you know, I just, I kind of acquired, when I acquired the company, it was very small, you know, five, five person company, but, um, you know, they had developers and, and a project manager and, and all those kinds of things. So when I fir first hired, like had the choice to hire a person, it was, yeah, it was a, it was a marketing person and this was right at the beginning this was like 2008 or something. So right at the beginning of like social media and, and all that. Yeah. But in terms of like, let's say if somebody is starting an agency now and they're like a single person, what would you recommend they should hire as their first hire? Well, yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. I think it, I, I think it has to do a lot with your cap I'm, with your cap with your own capabilities. So in other words, I would say, you know, what complements you the most, as far as, you know, you don't, if you're a designer, you don't need another designer or, you know, another way to look at it, which I haven't, I haven't done, but others have, have told me as, as good advice is find the things that are taking up your time and um, not necessarily high dollar things. In other words, focus on, um, focus on someone that you can afford because, you know, if you're starting out it may not, you may not be able to afford a high salary, but what are all of those tasks that take up all your time that keeps you from selling, from delivering great work, from, from all that. So almost like an administrative role, it, you know, it, to me, that sounds counterintuitive at, at first, because you think, oh, well, no, I need somebody to do high level stuff or this or that. But really, you know, if you're, if you're able to do that, find someone that takes your, that keeps your mind focused on the more strategic stuff. So, yeah, that's very cool. So when you started, like at the very beginning of the agency and also like the first years, how clear was your vision? Like, did you know that um, you were one day going to sell the agency or did it more emerge along the way? Yeah, I definitely did not um, have a, that kind of vision when I first started. I mean, I think at, at first it was really just about um, the just doing what I liked all day. And, you know, we were working out at first, we were working out of our, my basement basically. So we were, you know, we were very, very, we were a startup agency. I think when I, when I made the decision, so, you know, things went through a couple iterations there. So um, I ended up after, after I acquired that company, I ended up, I brought on a couple of people as partners then. And then I bought those two partners out um, in about 2000, 13, 14. So when I did that, I, I did that with the intent of I was going to sell. So it took, it took me a while. I mean, I, you know, like you said, I have a photography background. I'm not a business, I'm not an MBA. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not the finance person, all that kind of stuff. So it took me, it took me quite a bit of learning by doing to figure out really not, not only how to um, be profitable, which I'm proud that you know, the last five years of the company, we were incredibly profitable, grew, you know, grew revenue significantly, all of that stuff. But that was all because I had learned enough to bring on smarter people than me about all of those things that I'm just, again, not, not an expert at, but I did make, excuse me, I did make the conscious decision to, that I was going to sell, um, you know, I would say about, about four years before, um, before I did and, mm -hmm. and worked, you know, made, made some, conscious decisions along the way about how to do that. Yeah, um, I think that's very cool. And um, please t share with us, like, if you don't mind me uh, asking this, like, how was your experience working with partners in, the, in your agency? Because I, I sometimes find it harder to think about working with people who sometimes don't share your vision or don't share the kind of energy. So how did you, first of all, um, how did you find the same um, kind of wavelength around these partners and 
why did you end them end up buying them out? Yeah, yeah. So um, there, there there were two different sets. So you know, kind of two different sets of reasons. I mean, I think you know the first the first set um, they were friends, and um, well, one of them is my ex wife. So um, you know, there's but we're all we all still talk with each other for you know <laughs> for, for what it's worth. But so it was, you know an amicable enough breakup of all of all kinds. But you know, we were friends, and we were you know, I was 24 years old and knew nothing about business, just again, wanted to be a web designer and, and do this cool stuff that I saw, you know, coming down the pike and whatever. And um, quickly learned that it was really hard to, to run and start a, a company. And, and, you know, I think for other personal reasons, a couple of them left as well. So, you know, ju that just, it, it kind of was <laughs> what it was, I guess, as far as we, we tried it, it didn't quite work out. The second set um, of partners was, it, it was a, a little more strategic difference. And, you know, I, I acquired the company. I brought in a couple of people from that company as partners and, you know, great, you know, really rounded out from an operations and a technology perspective, really rounded out the company. We had a number of great years. Um, I think we just came to the decision or I came to the decision that I wanted to grow a little bit more and more quickly and, and ultimately sell and not, uh, you know, I, th I think the others um, wanted to just kind of keep things going and, and maintain and, and, you know, we were doing well, we were making money, you know, there was no reason to, to change anything really, but I just saw, I, I saw opportunity and, and wanted to take a little risk and, and growth. And, and so, you know, that's, I think that's why we parted. Okay. So um, what's really cool is that you work with like brands like Na NASA, like how did you get into those, those brands and like, like from the start of the agency onwards, how long did it take you to win those enterprise clients? Yeah, NASA was an interesting one. Um, we, that, we got them early on. I mean, they're, you know, I guess part of the benefit of being, you know, we're in the DC area, it's um, most federal government agencies, you know, are have obviously have significant presences in in dc nasa has some you know headquarters has some big um, presences outside but we were able to work with the local um uh the local uh you know air group there in uh, just outside dc um yeah it, it was that was just a matter of networking and um you know it was a small it was a small specialized project and i think that's where um, you know, a lot of those names that, that you mentioned that we worked with, um, you know, we weren't agency of record for Toyota for, you know, like we were, a, we were at most, uh, you know, 30 person agency. So weren't, you know, weren't a, a huge um, national conglomerate, like, like some of those companies that work with those brands, but we found um, specialized ways to work with, with all of those companies. And so, you know, with NASA, we built an interactive platform for training for them. Um, it was, it was something that we did quite well. We had some, you know, some good, um, references and, and stuff like that. And, you know, I would say some of those others as well is just, we filled a really unique niche, um, for them that, uh, you know, for, for one reason or other, um, uh, you, no one was really filling that gap. Mm. And how long is the sales process with, with those enterprise clients versus let's say working with SME companies? Yeah. I mean, it's per you know, it depends on the size of the project. And so I think the, um, you know, what I know and, and, and since then have worked with some, you know, some, some other like fortune 50 companies and stuff, the sales process can be very, very long. And, you know, it can be, a, you know, uh, what, what would be from a small to medium sized company take three to six months. It could take, you know, nine to 12 or even more months, but I, it, you know, it kind of depends on the, the need and the the way in uh, you know so for instance um with volkswagen for instance we did we worked on a partnership program with them so in other words uh, volkswagen and a nonprofit organization it was a you know corporate social responsibility um campaign and so therefore we were working on behalf of the nonprofit entity who was already a customer they were brought in and so that was actually that from from the point aspect of sales go that was an easy sale because we were already kind of brought in as part of that um you know that arrangement we didn't have to pitch volkswagen which i have 
since and it's a very long um, arduous process even to get on their vendor list but um so you know it, again it kind of depends and you know so some of those other ones took you know it took a year to actually get in the door some it was really just we were in the right place at the right time um so yeah I, you know it's it's hard to it's hard to give advice on being in the right place at the right time because obviously that's just a that's a coincidence um in in the making but um you know i i think back in the we we there were two different kind of waves that we that we wrote and one the social media marketing i mean it's you know it's so ubiquitous now people take it for granted that you know it's just a major way that you market but back in 2008 2009 it, there were there were a lot of companies that didn't have a social media marketing person on staff and very very large organizations so at that time in that place for us to come in and say yeah we know this you know even myspace was a thing back then right so yeah. like you know we know how to do all of this marketing on social media for you um we that was right place right time that obviously that's completely different today but it, i think the the um it's still analogous to today because i mean you just need to find that niche where what's what's new and what are what are those companies lacking in-house yeah, I think before we move on to your SaaS business, I want to selfishly ask this question. Um, how did you price your offering? Was it purely based on time or value? And with that, if somebody wants to set up an agency, what should be the pricing model they should set? Sure. Yeah. So we um, we had a we had both a, a project based and a retainer model. And I would say, you know, when, whenever possible, we tried to get on retainer, which was, I mean, overall, we tried to calculate things based on the amount of time it would take. And, and we, we went to great lengths to track um, the amount of time that, that a project would take. So, you know, a, the most common project for us would be a web de design and development project. And so we went, I, we, one of my, my partners went to great lengths to like break it down so granularly and, and everything like that. What I will say about that is it was never the same twice. It was never even close to the same twice. The scope was never even so similar, you know, one time to the other. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how much to charge when at the end of the day, it, it often came down our, our like gut feeling ended up being better than you know looking at the last two projects and averaging it out and, and everything like that now that's not to say that you shouldn't try to to track hours or anything because there were insights that we got from that that we know there there were surprises where you know i i guess i was a little more like i'll just wing it and 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 figure out you know what makes sense or what the market will bear so to speak but you know, there were there were definitely learnings and sort of surprising insights that we got of you know the i think the biggest one was how much time we spent testing like no one no one could have guessed how much time we spent testing until we saw it you know in, in black and white um but there were a lot of other things where we'd grossly underestimate based on past projects or just tracking and everything like that so um, but, you know, it was always an attempt to try to match, you know, hours with dollars and, you know, again, unless it was on the retainer side and then we tried to do that, but, you know, on a, on a rolling basis, retainers just became more about stability and, um, you know, just recurring, recurring revenue. And, uh, you know, when, when we were the most profitable, I think we were about 70 to 80% retainer clients versus and, and 20 to 30 project-based clients. And that's, you know, just for that reason of we, we knew what was coming in for the next, you know, we lost some retainers here and there, but, um, you know, we knew it was coming in for the next six months, really, unless something, something major happened. Yeah. Okay. So comparing like the landscape, how it is right now and in the year 2020 versus 2003, or let's say maybe even 2010, I mean, from the outside, I mean, it seems that a lot of things have changed. Like the market is very saturated now with a lot of agencies out there and with a lot of freelancers that just start their own PPC agency or just freelance uh, PPC business or whatever. As, as, it seems very saturated. So what would you say is the future of online agencies and digital agencies? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, maybe there's a, I, I got out of the business, so to speak, in, you know, um, a couple of years ago, um, after, after selling and, you know, I stayed at the, the company that acquired, 
um, acquired Carousel 30 for you know, for a couple of years um, just to transition things over and everything. Um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I saw it getting tougher, um, you know, even back in 2017, as far as, you know, there's just more players. It's easier to do um, the more technical stuff. So, you know, it's, it's way easier to build a website now than it was, you know, in 2010. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways. There's, you know, anything from Squarespace to just, it's easier to write code um, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, so we were building very, you know, enterprise level, you know, digital experiences, personalization, all of that. That's still absolutely needed, but there's, yeah, there, there's been so much um, like acquisition. And so, you know, just consolidating all the, all the agencies. And then to your point, there's so many freelancers out there. Uh, you know, again, that's why I started the, the company that I'm at now, but you know, there's so many freelancers out there or even just small teams working together that really can do the work. And I think, you know, the other, the other big shift that's happened is um, in-house talent and, and the, the concept of the in-house agency, you know, it, it, to, to an extent it always existed, but I have seen so much more um, uh, investments in building out an internal team that has most of the capabilities of an agency. And then the problem with that for the for agencies is I think it makes agency work a lot more of a commodity and and um, and less of because a lot of the strategy is now being done by you know by the by the clients that was previously outsourced and and stuff like that. So you know to answer your question, I wish I had a better answer. Honestly, I, I think we're I, I think there there is a cyclical nature of of marketing agencies. And I, I do see whether it's for economic reasons or, or whatever, I do see this in-house agency trend shifting back to um, more, more onus on the agencies. I just, it, it doesn't seem like it's slowing down too much right now, but I, I do think companies are going to find that, you know, the in-house agency model is great for a number of reasons for efficiency, but it's not good for innovation and really keeping, uh, you know, an agency's job is to be innovative and bring new things to the table and all that. And, you know, in some cases it's, it's on a very small tactical level, but it's still, it's an agency's job to get experience from, you know, a million different clients and customers and industries and, and all those kinds of things and bring that back to each individual company. You just don't get that if you have the same people working at the same company for, you know, five, 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is the whole um, point about innovation, that agencies work with different verticals, they have different styles of, you know, different working with different campaigns, they get so much of um, understanding of what works and what doesn't. Um, in house, it will be very hard because you'll be like almost doing the same thing over and over again. Um, but now I'm like really excited about and want to know more about uh, career gig. Uh, just to give you some background, I was actually on Upwork for quite a few years and then um, had a top rated account for years, but always felt it was still missing something. So maybe you can help um, us understand more about career gig. How is it different and um, what challenges do you face at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the the first reason we started Career Gig was really just to, you know, we, so a after I sold the agency, I, I worked a lot in the workforce development and employee experience space and for, for a number of large companies as well as some smaller ones. But, you know, just saw repeatedly, uh, you know, a lot of it was based on in, in you know, full-time, um, you know, full-time employees. Um, but kept running into this growth of the freelance economy and, uh, you know, just more and more companies working with contractors or, you know, finding ways to work with contractors um, because of the ability of, you know, to be more efficient and, and scalable and, and flexible and, and stuff like that. And so that, you know, that was even pre COVID, which, um, you know, brought on a whole set of new challenges, but, you know, I, I were, I was seeing the, um, the growth of that market. And yet I was seeing, um, you know, one, one of the things that we wanted to solve as well, uh, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned Upwork, for instance, a um, lot of people on there. I mean, that, you know, that platform has been around since, you know, since I was yeah. at that first startup. I mean, there were Elance, you know, yeah, and then and Elance. To, to, you know, so definitely, you know, they've, they've established them as a player, but 
we want to start we want to have a platform that people love working with and for and i don't think there's platforms out there that you know they're they're means to an end and they're you know they are they're connectors they're marketplaces and all that but there's a number of problems that that need to be solved and and some of those extend to anyone in the in the workforce but so one one of the things that we see is um five-star rating systems um you know things like that it's uh, it's a it's a phenomenon that if you get a bad rating you can shut down your profile and start a new one and then get a new you know get a new lease on on life so to speak so you know in in a world like that what does what does a rating really mean to most of the world when there are plenty of people out there you know if you were if you were rated five stars you were doing a good job you know working hard uh, you know being diligent about customer service and all of that and yet you're compared with that other person wherever they might be they might be next door or around the world but that person that invited a hundred of their best friends to like give them a five-star rating and then all of a sudden you're on equal footing with someone that is nowhere near as qualified as you know as as yourself and so there's a problem with reputation um in you know just in general i mean another another uh, tangent but but related is resumes or you could take that to extend to social media profiles but you know 75 percent of resumes and cvs have uh, at least one factual inaccuracy um if you take that a step further whether that's intentional or unintentional it's still true you know and so if you take that a step further you know my profile on linkedin or other other things they're they're only what i want the world to see i mean there's i don't have a lot of you know skeletons in the closet or, or anything like that but um you know it it is a view of what i want the world to see as opposed as opposed to a very accurate you know completely accurate view of this happened then this happened these people vouch for me there and i have this certification and so on and so forth so what we're trying to build with career gig is let's let's level the playing field for people that are truly skilled at what they do that have the background that really um you know that really backs up what they're what they're trying to do and let's put that forward instead of a popularity contest and and instead of just trying to be okay i'm going to talk really good about myself and hope you hope you pick me let's build this uh we call it like a staircase of proof of 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 reputation and and then you know people can still decide they can like someone's profile over another and and hire them but let's give people a better, a better way of assessing who's good and, and who's not. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that was one thing. The other, um, so that on the, on the company side, we were really trying to solve that, but I also think it helps the freelancers to, to be able to, again, have, have a, have a fairer chance against people that just happen to know how to game systems better. Um, the other thing that we saw on the, on the freelancer side um, is offering them benefits that they might not they might not get as an independent. And so here in the United States, um, our um, lovely healthcare system is not um, the same as, as elsewhere in the world. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of challenges that independents go through um, to get access to guaranteed healthcare and, and other things like that. In addition to healthcare, um, we do like life insurance and disability and a lot of other things that um, you know, that, that are, that are really valuable as well. And so that, you know, we started with insurance because we're, you know, we're based in the United States, but slowly expanding, you know, internationally. Um, but we see offering benefits, ben the definition of benefits can be as broad as, um, you know, as, as it, as is really, uh, beneficial, I guess, to the, to the freelancer. And so, again, we want to be a platform that people love working on and that really helps them be better at what they do and actually enjoy, or, or enjoy more the parts of the business that they know less. Like, you know, for me, it's the financial and the operational pieces. Yeah, I think the point you made with um, really, really understanding how good a person is and really trusting their reviews is super relevant. I think it's one of the biggest needs right now out there because, I mean, we see that in our industry as well. They're like some sort of lifetime deal platforms for software. And sometimes we see like there's a review which is written in a, some sort of neg negative sense, but the hosting platform hosting that offer still gave it five stars. So it seems like almost like a cheated system in itself. And I think trust these days, 
seems to become like a more valuable currency, let's put it this way. I definitely see this as a huge need. Um, so, and I wanted to ask you like, what's super interesting for us also is like how you market your SaaS business. Like what are the, the biggest marketing channels for Karegic right now? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, because we're a marketplace that sells to both B2B and B2C, um, you know, that's also, you know, certainly an interesting thing. So, you know, it's different, it's different methods for different, for the, for the mm -hmm. two different audiences. So, you know, for, for freelancers, I think the biggest, the biggest, um, way that we've been able to draw in, um, subscribers is just to show the, the gigs that we have on the platform and, you know, give them a taste of, of what they're going to get once they, once they sign up. And so, you know, from that perspective, it's about making sure that our jobs are distributed, you know, in the widest way possible. And then we talk about them and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fairly practical, um, practical method because we say, okay, well, we have these jobs available. If you come and sign up, you can, you can apply for them and stuff like that. Um, we do that, I mean, over a variety of, of methods, including existing, you know, job platforms that people might be using to social media, to, you know, advertising on, on other digital channels. And I mean, it's really, at this point, it's all digital and, and, um, and stuff like that on the, on the company side, it's a lot more about, um, it's a slower sale, even though we're a platform that, you know, any company or freelancer could sign up today, but a lot of the companies that we're, that we're talking with want to see a demo and want to understand, um, about the process a little bit more. And so even though they could sign up, um, instantly, it usually we're going to do a, a more, a slower sales process. So it's about content marketing and lead nurturing. And, you know, so we're putting out white papers and doing webinars and, mm -hmm. and blog content and all that kind of an inbound marketing approach to really, um, get people interested. Um, they're not going to necessarily change their behavior on day one. A freelancer, um, might sign up on a whim and, and check out the platform and everything like that. But I think a company is going to take a little more um, studied approach, but, um, but once they get it and, and understand it and we walk them through and everything, um, then, you know, the, it's, it's, it, the, the sale is relatively easy. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a major challenge because once you have a marketplace, you always have to do the, like the chicken and the egg situation here because you have to balance it. Um, but at the moment, do you run any kind of campaigns geared towards freelancers? Like how do you attract them towards, um, towards this platform? Because if somebody already has spent years on people per hour or Upwork or other platforms out there, what is the call for them to set up um, a profile here? Okay. Yeah, I think our, you know, what our, our biggest differentiator, I mean, you know, it's, it's easy to use the platform and it's easy to sign up and, and all those kinds of things. So that's, I think that kind of has to be a given with any, with any of the platforms, but I mean, I, we've, we've been told that we're, you know, it's, it's easier than, than some of those, you know, some of those that you mentioned even, but I think, you know, our, the main stickiness right now is really the benefits piece, which is just not offered by anyone else. They, they haven't even approach that. And so, you know, with that, that, that also only that appeals to a, a very specific audience as well that has those needs for, for the benefits. Um, but, um, you know, the, the other piece is just attracting the right companies, uh, you know, so you mentioned the chicken or egg thing like that. Yeah, that is, <laughs> that is our lot. Uh, that's our lives right now is figuring out, okay, well, what day are we going to focus on which thing? Because we grew a little bit more here or there and, and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's about finding ways to, to make our, you know, to make our platform a, a little, a little stickier and, you know, we're, we're less, um, uh, we're less adamant that you only use our platform. I think some, you know, some of the other, some of the other sites out there are, you know, they, they really, they attempt to try to keep you on, um, and only on theirs. We're a little more agnostic about it simply because, we know that the stickiness of the, the benefits piece is going to keep people like you don't qualify for them unless you run enough work through the platform. And so therefore there's incentive for them to do that, not just switch over from somewhere else for no reason. Like there, there's actually incentive for them to do that. And so that's, you know, that's where we see a lot of opportunity there and in, in growing that community aspect of it. And, you know, whether that's, it's not going to only be on the insurance side, um, you know, in very soon, we're going to grow that in a lot of different ways. Mm. So, um, how does your team size look like and, um, where do you personally spend your time on while building the SaaS? 
Yeah, so um, we've got about 12 people um, at this point. So we're, you know, we're, we're bringing on probably about one or two people per month. So, um, you know, s slow, uh, but we're still, um, you know, we're still in the fundraising stage as well. So we're um, raising a seed round right now and, 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 and making some good progress there. But, um, you know, as far as my day goes, um, so, you know, I, as, as the CEO, I play a lot of different, I oversee everything, you know, in a, in a sense, but um, I would say my, you know, if my special project is I have two, two other co-founders that, that focus on various, various areas, but my special projects are in the marketing realm just because of my marketing background. And so um, you could say I'm, I'm interim CMO as well, just simply because I'm, I'm overseeing a team there. We've got about four people um, doing various things on marketing and we've got a couple people doing sales. So, you know, a team of about six, um, six plus six, seven people, I guess, um, counting a, someone doing customer service. So, um, so yeah, that, you know, that keeps me plenty, plenty busy while also working on some of the investor relations and, um, you know, just kind of overseeing the overall vision for the, for the product and the, and the company and, uh, and stuff. That's pretty cool. And in terms of um, the channels itself, for example, things like cold calling or cold emails, have they have they worked for you for for enterprise level accounts or clients? Yeah, they do. I mean, it's um, I wish they worked better. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be honest, <laughs> but you know, we're 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 in the you know I'm a very uh, strong believer in in agile you know methodologies and, and processes, and so you know we're we're in the in the try um, you know. The test phase of, of many different things at once and you know so we're trying a lot of things we're you know iterating optimizing so you know we do cold emailing we do cold calling we do linkedin outreach we do you know um you name it we've probably <laughs> tried it and and either either keep doing it because we think it either is working or could work or yeah. dropped it because it didn't work so it's um that's kind of the you know that we i mean we launched in in earnest in in mid july so you know we're really only a few months in to, um to the to the process here but um but yeah it's you know it's it it works it's i, I will say i didn't do a lot of the cold um you know the cold lead gen at at my agency so you know some of this is a bit newer to me to be honest so it's um it's 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 interesting but yeah we're you know we're, we're getting we're getting in the door and and you know there's lots of there's lots of approaches i mean you know doing doing podcasts like this and and other things as well you know doing pr doing you know we're doing so so many different things for such a small team i'm i'm proud we're able to cover a lot of ground and and yet be methodical about you know okay well is this working because we only have so many dollars to spend so it's uh, it's a, it's a, every day's an adventure <laughs> Yeah. So I, while I was looking at your profiles online, I saw that you you've done quite a number of things outside the core business. So you've written a couple, you've written a few books, you do uh, speaking engagements, and I think you also contributor for Forbes. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, um, what's you what's what exciting things are next for you? Or is it right now all towards building up your platform? Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 exciting thing for me is, I mean, this is I'm, I'm really looking forward to focusing more and more on, on career gig. And I think I do, I'm, I'm finishing up another book. Um, you know, it'll be done in a, in a few months, but, um, outside of that and, you know, I, I have a podcast as well. I mean, I, I writing and, and, and doing a podcast, the, to me, that's me doing sales and business development and strategic development and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. So that's, it's always, it's always been about, um, you know, trying to find, the best ways to either learn by, you know, by having great conversations or um, just, you know, putting thoughts out there that, um, that I feel like um, help whatever, you know, whatever company I'm, I'm involved in at the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is my, so I, you know, I've, I've been a, let's call it a consultant um, my entire career um, other than, you know, a, a job out of college. So, you know, this is my first time being a client, um, you know, in the, to use the agency speak. So, you know, it's, it's very, very, it's a very interesting world where I, you know, I have the ability to focus on one thing, even though there's a lot going on, I have the ability to focus on one thing all day. 
go very deep as opposed to as an agency, you know, I'll confess we did a lot of work. We, I'm proud of a lot of work we did, but a lot of it was only, you know, it was, it was kind of shallow because we only worked on one tactic or one project or, or whatever. And uh, there was a big in-house team or other agencies or whatever that worked on other things involving all the marketing. So overseeing everything, even in the marketing realm here is exciting because um, it, you really see the entire journey of, of t multiple types of customers, as well as be, have firsthand, um, you know, having um, oversight over the product and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it's, um, you know, that this is, this is what I'm doing now. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to keep doing it more. Yeah, I mean, I can relate to that. Like, it's, it's super exciting to do marketing for a SaaS because of exactly that. You can do everything around one brand which we really enjoy as well. Um, okay, so- Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, <laughs> go on. Uh, yeah, I was just saying like, um, I've got probably a million other questions, but is there anything which you would like um, like to kind of probably share which, me, which me, we might have missed? Or is there anything, if, for example, our audience, we have people who are obviously from the business side as well as freelancers who listen to us. So it'll be good to maybe connect with them and uh, reach out to them in case if they wanna join the platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would, I would love um, careergig.com. It's, it's free to sign up. It's, it's really easy to, um, to get a profile there and, and, and check it out. Um, you know, we, we're still, it's, it's early enough days. I would love feedback on, on the process and, you know, even the ideas that, that we're talking about and, and the, the challenges that we're trying to solve. I'd love to hear feedback on, you know, if, you know, if your audience has, has seen it solved in different ways or has ideas or anything like that, I mean, you know, we're, we want to, like I said, we want to, we want to build a platform that people love using, uh, because that's just not something that exists in our, in our, in our, in our marketplace right now. So I would, would definitely love that. And, and definitely, um, you know, if, if anybody wants to reach out, I'm very active on LinkedIn, um, you know, just say, you, uh, saw me, heard me on this show and, and, and reach out and I'd love to, Love to have some conversations. Yeah, very nice. Cool. So we, we appreciate you coming on the show today and uh, thanks a lot for sharing your, your journey and all the learnings with us. Yeah, absolutely. No, it was, it was great to talk with you. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks for watching this video. If you've enjoyed the content, there's a lot more coming up. So please subscribe below.